How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss some of the more recent discoveries, and actually somewhat groundbreaking discoveries, when it comes to our neighbor, Venus. And specifically, we're going to try to answer the question in regards to ancient oceans on Venus, we're also going to discuss the idea behind Venusian impacts, and also at least one study that actually proposes that life on Venus can technically exist even now. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but let's start with the original question researchers had for several decades. The question in regards to Earth's twin. So back in the days, billions of years ago, was Venus similar to Earth and did it contain oceans as well that could have maybe even hosted life? And the thing is, these questions are not hypothetical. This is based on the observations from the Venusian atmosphere from decades and decades ago. Here's for example one of the older studies that explores the idea behind the ratio between deuterium and hydrogen. And that's because earlier probes discovered that for some reason Venus had an extremely high ratio of deuterium, which is of course the heavier isotope of hydrogen, with the ratio being approximately 120 times as big as Earth. And this was actually a potential signature of a lost primordial ocean. Or maybe all of the deuterium and all of this water was delivered by comets. Or maybe there's some other explanation. But the biggest explanation was basically that this was some kind of a remnant from the ancient ocean, where a lot of hydrogen disappeared from the atmosphere, mostly because it's a little bit lighter, and a lot of deuterium stayed behind. And naturally, on top of this, we know that Venus and Earth are relatively same in size, with additional data from Venusian clouds even suggesting that it potentially contained some kind of a water cycle. Which basically led to two potential evolutionary theories. Either Venus was once very similar to Earth and supported liquid water, which then for some reason led to a major runaway greenhouse effect, with Venus transforming dramatically and becoming extremely hot, very pressurized, and filled with CO2 and acid. Or Venus was actually born hot and there was never any water or obviously any sign of habitability. In which case it would be difficult to explain some of the observations from the atmosphere. But there are these two studies that just came out that possibly explain a lot of stuff by basically studying chemical reactions in the upper Venusian atmosphere. And so in this first study by Arnaud Mahio and his team, researchers mostly focused on the ratio between deuterium and hydrogen, and specifically between H2O or water and HDO or heavy water, with the data coming from the Venus Express space probe by the European Space Agency. And so based on some of the previous studies, the assumption was always that, back in the days, billions of years ago, both Earth and Venus very likely had similar deuterium to hydrogen ratios, which Earth maintained because it still has water today, but because Venus lost its water, mostly deuterium remained. And so the fact that there was a lot more heavy water compared to regular water potentially suggested that there was an ocean after all, but it was lost over time. But turns out that this is maybe not the case. Because in this case, this discovery challenges this assumption by looking at the effects from the sunlight and specifically the UV light and the enrichment that can actually be guided entirely by the sun and the chemical reactions involving sulfuric acid. And so in this case, the researchers believe that the deuterium enrichment is actually the result of chemistry that's been going on on Venus for billions of years and not ancient oceans. It seems to be the result of solar radiation breaking down water isotopes, which produce hydrogen and deuterium atoms, which causes hydrogen atoms to escape, but deuterium to stay behind. But a much more important discovery here was that there seems to be a dramatic increase in concentration between 70 and 110 kilometers in altitude, with the highest altitudes having levels 1500 times higher than Earth. And to the scientists behind this paper, this actually suggested that there was actually chemistry below this level, and all of this potentially was driven by something else. And so here they explain this by using hydrated sulfuric acid, and specifically the aerosols of sulfuric acid that seem to form right above the clouds. And so essentially, as you can see from the schematic, they actually think that all of this starts with these sulfuric acid aerosols being basically evaporated and broken down by the sunlight, which turns into sulfur oxide and into either water or heavy water. And intriguingly, right above 80 kilometers in altitude, there is an increase in concentration of SO2, or sulfur dioxide. And after this, the water separated from the sulfuric acid once again gets broken down by the sunlight, with hydrogen escaping and deuterium possibly sticking around just a little bit longer. But in this case, quite a lot of molecules, including water, heavy water, sulfur dioxide and atomic oxygen, recirculate back into the lower atmosphere, restarting the cycle once again. 
And so essentially here, they explain these unusual chemical anomalies as a result of the sulfuric acid cycle and not really anything to do with actual water. Which also explains the dramatic variation of hydrogen and deuterium when it comes to the altitude and various effects from the sunlight that seems to drive everything. Moreover, to support this point even more, there was actually a separate study, and here's the study from December of 2024 by Teresa Constantino, Oliver Shortle, and Paul Reimer, that assessed Venusian atmosphere from a different perspective and kind of came to the same conclusion. Here they basically calculated the present destruction of water and the destruction of other molecules like carbon dioxide, carbonyl sulfide, and many other molecules, which we know must come from volcanic gases from within Venus. And we also know that on Earth, most of these volcanic eruptions are usually made out of water, or essentially steam. And that's because our planet contains a lot of water inside. There's actually a much older video on the channel that should be in the description that talks about how inside our planet, right underneath the crust, we can actually find several worth of oceans all hidden in various minerals. But based on the gas composition of Venus, here the suggestion is that Venusian volcanic gases must be super dry. They seem to only have 6% water, implying that Venusian mantle and Venusian crust are extremely dehydrated. In other words, the research today suggests that Venus potentially never had an ocean, because in this case the sulfuric cycle can easily produce all of the observations we have from what we're seeing inside Venusian atmosphere. But here's the thing, a lot of these are just theories and none of this is going to be proven until the mission that's going to happen in a few years. You can learn about this in one of the videos in the description, but NASA's Da Vinci mission is going to be going on the surface and reporting back on what it discovers. Here this is going to be a combination between a Venusian probe and a small lander that's basically going to conduct a detailed gas analysis. And so until that mission, we're just going to have a bunch of theories, but nothing concrete yet. But there is actually another exciting discovery coming from the Venusian surface. And in this case, all of this was based on a thorough analysis of a feature known as Tessera Terrain. Here's a picture of Maxwell Montes that sort of shows us how all of this looks like. And in this case, Venusian Tessera basically represent a heavily deformed terrain that seems to be tectonic in nature, but whose true origin is currently unknown. But two of the most common explanations basically involved either some kind of a tectonic motion, like you see right here, which produced these bizarre formations on the surface, or maybe some kind of a really powerful impact that caused a lot of lava to eventually solidify, producing these strange formations. With one major mystery about Venus being that, for the longest time, nobody actually knew why it doesn't seem to have any large craters. For example, it does not have any craters older than 500 million years, which is actually believed to be the result of volcanism, but it also doesn't have any large craters more than 300 kilometers across, so essentially it does not contain any impact basins, and that's really weird because Mercury is filled with them and Earth contains quite a few as well. As a matter of fact, one of the largest ones was discovered not so long ago in Eastern Australia. You can learn about this in one of the videos in the description. And so, why not Venus? Well, the obvious answer is that Venus very likely had them too, but for some reason they either don't look the same or they disappeared over time. And so here, by studying one of the tessera known as Haste Bad, researchers identified two massive impacts but they look very different from what we expected and from what we've seen almost anywhere else. Which actually gives us a bit of a clue about what Venus was like back in the days and what Venus contains on its surface. And so here the scientists discovered a series of concentric rings, approximately 1500 kilometers across, that can only really be the sign of an impact. It would be very challenging to explain this otherwise. And mostly because of their unusual circular formation and the relationship to one another. In essence though, this impact basin would possibly look something like this billions of years ago. And so here the researchers believe that this was a result of two giant impacts, possibly one after the other, very likely three and a half billion years ago, when Venus was still not that solid and very likely contained very thin crust and a lot of molten magma underneath. And the reason researchers believe that's what Venus was like is because we actually observed something extremely similar on another object. This looks bizarrely similar to what we actually see on moons of Jupiter. For example, here's what we see on Europa. And in this case, these rings are the result of an extremely elastic layer, which basically forms rings instead of a large impact crater, because in this case, for Europa, lots and lots of water pours out, deforming the crust and freezing underneath. And here's a much better example. This is Valhalla, 
the largest known multi ring impact structure in the solar system that we can easily see on Callisto, the moon of Jupiter. And so in a very similar fashion, something similar must have formed on Venus when two large objects, possibly 75 kilometers across, hit the somewhat molten upper layer, punching through the surface and causing a lot of lava to flow through, which deformed the crust in an extremely similar fashion to what we see on Callisto and Europa, basically forming concentric rings and no crater. And because this suggests a very thin layer of crust and an extremely hot liquid mantle right underneath it, this once again confirms that 3.5 billion years ago, Venus was potentially extremely different from planet Earth, unlikely to have habitable conditions, and more likely to have some extreme conditions we cannot imagine. But there is still one more study I wanted to discuss that actually does give us hope in regards to life. And here this is based on a study by Daniel Uzdevich and his team that basically analyzed various organic molecules and various organic membranes and how they react to extremely enriched sulfuric acid conditions. And so here they essentially tried to simulate Venusian atmosphere, where instead of water, they added a bunch of sulfuric acid. And surprisingly, in these sulfuric conditions, because it's a polar molecule and can easily form networks of hydrogen bonds, it can actually act as a solvent in a very similar way to water. And while their results are really surprising. For example, in this picture, it shows us a formation of vesicle-like structures and the formation of additional lipid structures that in some sense resemble something we find inside cells. Likewise, when they actually added preformed vesicles, or basically these tiny structures we usually find inside cells, they easily survive these acidic conditions independent of concentration. With the main conclusion coming out of this paper basically being that maybe we don't really need water. Or maybe certain aspects of chemistry when it comes to life can actually tolerate other solvents such as sulfuric acid. Moreover, they directly demonstrated stability of various lipid membranes in various acidic conditions as well. Which of course implies that certain types of cells that do have certain types of membranes can easily survive on Venus. In this case, the discovery is that single-chain saturated lipids that contain sulfates, alcohol, trimethylamine and a phosphonate head group are extremely resistant to sulfuric acid and can easily form higher order structures required for complex life. Here they were able to create membranes, micelles, vesicles and a lot of individual parts we normally find inside cells. And that's actually a pretty important discovery because it once again confirms that, technically, life could exist in the Venusian atmosphere, just maybe not the same type of life that we expect on planet Earth. Although in reality, even certain cells from Earth could possibly survive there as well. And that's of course on top of previous propositions in regards to potential life on Venus. You can learn about them in some of the videos in the description. But until those missions I mentioned, and until we go back to Venus and try to explore the atmosphere in more detail, we're not going to know more. Which means that when it comes to life on Venus, most of this is still extremely hypothetical. But we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the other videos. And thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by doing a channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.